I think that we have to recognize that the generation below us are just as equipped for the fight as we are. So we just have to empower them. A few minutes ago, I got to hear from my good friend Julius Thomas about the work we did in 2020 yeah. and listening to his voice and bringing him to the table and then allowing him to grow into the organizer that he is today. And the only reason we did that is we recognized the skill that was within him. And so I think we do ourselves a disservice when we, as you know, the seasoned generation, and again, there are three generations that work. There's the wisdom generation, that's my father, my mother generation, that's my generation, the professional generation, we are the ones that are in the professional positions, and then there's the energy generation, the one below us. Okay. We have to recognize that we got to where we are because of the wisdom generation. It's our job as a professional generation to get the energy generation to where we are. So I think we just have to recognize that they are talented, we just have to empower them to use that talent, to breathe that innovative life. And so I think that, you know, after we finish the panel, we will go outside to the young people and just have a conversation and remind them 20 years ago, we were sitting in the same spot. Yeah. How do you want to get to where we are so we can foster that relationship? I think that's how we do it. That's right. Yeah, and not just call on our younger generations when we don't know how to operate our phones. That too. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm saying? You know, sometimes that's the only time we have younger generations. A uh, very good president. Uh, Representative Derek Jackson, let me ask you this. How can residents find out how to be involved in their communities? And that includes like attending town halls and forums and, uh, you know, joining community <coughs> boards. How can residents find out how to do this? Yeah, listen, um, all I need to do is just have Montana come on up here and repeat okay. what she just said, right? No, I mean, listen, we have to get and engage. Everything that we do at the federal, state, and local is open to the public. It's required by law for the public to show up. Your government has to be held accountable. Yeah. And so, the, the, you know, I, I would say this, uh, Wanderlyn, um, if you do not show up, if you don't know who your mayor, city council, county commissioner, state representative, state house, shame on you. Shame on you. You cannot hold nobody accountable if you don't know them. The reason why my good brother can hold folks accountable because they know him and they and he knows them. Come on, right? This relationship has to go both ways. Yep. Right. And so, um, but yeah, we just have to do exactly what Montana said. We got to stay engaged. Uh, everything that we do is public. You can go to the website if you want to know where the money is being spent. Your tax dollars. Let me say that for the back of the room. Where the money is being spent. Talk about your it. tax dollars. Right? I mean, because you hear a lot of my counterparts right now talking about the $16 billion surplus. And, this, and it sounds good, but let me tell you, that 300-page budget also tells you where we're not doing our due diligence in serving the community. So when we start, when we have austerity cuts in public education, for example, right, when we should be paying at, let's say, $14 billion, but we're really paying at $2 billion. Well, guess what, uh, at $12 billion. So guess what that $2 billion is going to roll into? They're going to see it as a surplus. But no, we have mandated services that you all require for us, right? Because that's all politics, that's all we do. We do three things. I'm going to tell you real quick. He gave you three, I'm going to give you three. That's what alphas do. <laughs> we manage resources. Number one, that's all we do. We take in your tax dollars and we redistribute them. Infrastructure, transportation, water, all that. We redistribute your tax dollars, resources. Number two, our whole goal is about protecting your protections, like civil rights protections, criminal justice protections, right? So we write laws. Mm -hmm. And so what end up happening, some folks get protections, the others do not. Right? But we're writing laws around protections. And then third and not least is quality of life. That's all we do under the gold dome. And so when you talk talking about land, sir, around quality of life. So look at Roswell and, and Sandy Springs and Alpharetta. It's very different than Union City and College Park. Right? We determine where those roads are. We determine where potholes are. Talk about it. Okay? 
So those are the three things. And so you can only hold us accountable on those three things. But you got to know who your elected officials are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and good. they know, and they need to know who you are. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good, and this is helping us understand the importance of our engagement with officials and, and political leaders. Uh, League of Women, I, you know, you were shaking your head with <laughs> when Derek was talking. Uh, did you want to add to that? But also, I want to ask you, what are some challenges? that uh, voters are facing now, you know, as opposed to previous seasons, what are some of the challenges that we're facing? Well, you know, I will definitely say uh, the challenges um, came after our 2020 election here in the state of Georgia. You know, I say, when people say the what about, right? Okay. Well, you have the what about, and you guys still have long early voting times. What about, and you still have, you know, uh, you can vote, you know, you can do an absentee ballot because this state doesn't do this, this state doesn't do that. But a form of suppression and voter suppression is when you take the rights that you already had and start eliminating those rights. Mm -hmm. So we want to talk about a challenge. It was 180 days before an election date that you can ask for an absentee ballot. That went down to 79 days. Mm -hmm. They almost cut it in half, if not more than half. To receive your absentee ballot went from 49 days, which is almost a month and a half, to 29 days. So we're less than a month to get your absentee ballot. So the, you know, the nuances, that's a form of voter suppression. Yeah. Because they, at one point, before 2020, we had easier access. I live in Fulton County. During the pandemic, during the chaos that we had with you know, our voting and waiting four or five hours in Fulton County, Fulton County said, okay, we have a solution. We're gonna build two buses. We're gonna put the voting machines onto these buses and we're gonna travel up and down the uh, counties in places that we don't have early voting locations at. I use them just to see how it works. It worked just like as if I was walking to a building. There was a person checking my ID, I would get my voter card, here's the machines, I did my little tabbing, I had to scan it, they gave me my little sticker and I walked out of the bus. SB202 eliminated those buses. Now, one, my taxpayer dollars is now paying for buses for training because they bought those taxes, those buses. But that's used for training and only can be used in a, in a <laughs> sense of emergency. Yeah. So instead of allowing us to have more access, right, we have parts of, you know, Fulton County is one of the, lar is the largest county. Mm -hmm. And mass-wise, it's the largest county. Mm -hmm. You are now having a mobile situation that can give more access to people to their constitutional right. Yeah. That's a huge change. Mm -hmm. Challenges. Now, we all seen in the news when SB202 came out, and it was like, oh, these challenges of people trying to get pulled off the rolls. We just had a law that just got passed, SB189, that made those challenges even easier. Mm. So before, it could just be like, you know, Derek, I don't know what your middle initial is, but I, I've known Derek for a couple of years here, so I was like, well, let's say Derek's middle initial is Derek T. Jackson. If he forgot to put the T on there, that's an uh, option to say, we need to challenge his voting rights. That was it, before at 189. Now it could say, well, Derek, I, I Googled you and you have a house in New York. I'm challenging you now because not just your T, but because you have two houses, even though he's constantly been voting here. So they have now with 189 has made it easier to put more challenges. It's a burden on the individuals yeah. and it's also a burden on our Department of Elections. That's right. And so now, once again, where does that money come from? Because we also have bills that says that they cannot use outside funding to support those challenges. And let's not talk about you know certification because that's a whole that's a mm. post election situation that we're going to be going into mm. is certification. I mean, right here in Fulton County, we actually had a board of elections member who uh, who voted no to certify our primaries. Right. Yeah. She got overruled because the rest of the board said yes. Right. But this is not an uncommon thing. So these are the challenges that we're facing moving forward. And the reason why I was shaking my head is because you know I do sit on a city board. Okay. And you know, and trust me, my mayor knows me. The chief of staff knows me. Uh, everybody in the city of Atlanta knows me. Um, but it is the two-way. That's why I was shaking my head about that. Because it is a two-way situation. It's great to kind of say, hey, you know what? I showed up. But guess what? I don't know all your names in your face. You could show up at a council meeting. I'd be like, oh, yeah, the lady in the pink shirt showed up. Next week, she's going to have a red shirt. I don't know her name. I don't know who her, you know, who's her uh, official who's supposed to be over her. It's got to be you have to introduce yourself. you got to talk to people. If you know one person, they might not be representing you, but they know who does represent you. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna be like, well, I don't know if you're my representative, but I have this problem. Right. Guess what? They're gonna say, here's your representative. Mm -hmm. 
and then you start building that relationship. That's good. That's good. Most suppression happening, uh, you know, here in Georgia, and you can only imagine in other states as well. Uh, attorney, uh, attorney Webb, what are some of the um, laws and, and, and rights that impact us from a social perspective, perspective and even our culture as well? What are some of those rights that we need to know, laws that, are, uh, you know, that we need to understand that's happening out there today? Absolutely. I would say um, right now you see an attack on your First Amendment right to speech, right? We see it where a hot topic right now is Project 2025. And I don't know if any of you guys have even had an opportunity to really look at it and what they're doing. Um, the Comstock Act is an obscenity law from 1873, a Victorian age where women obviously were not afforded the same rights as we are here in 2024. To want to resurrect such an act would be a deprivation of rights. And we've already seen it with the recent Dobbs decision eradicating Roe v. Wade. So I think what we like for all of us, what we can say right now is like First Amendment, you have a right to be able to speak, but when we all need to raise our eyebrows when somebody wants to take that right away from us and then have this broad, vague language like was at the time in 1873 of what obscenity is because that is considered unprotected speech, just like if y'all were to say, um, it's a fire or I threaten your life or something of that nature, right? Um, another thing is, is that I think what we're not really seeing or talking about too much is the usurping of power from one branch of government to another. That right there is what scares me, but I mean, not to have a con law class, but you've done it since the deem of time in this country, right? Like all the way back to Marbury versus Madison, where you see people creating powers out of thin air because the constitutionalists certainly at the time did not say, um, you know, this idea of judicial review, where we have kind of emboldened and empowered now our Supreme Court to the point where if we usurp powers away from Congress, who are the lawmakers, over to the executive branch to empower a president to not make laws, right? Taking the power away from Congress mm -hmm. when his actual duties is to carry out the law, right? Like when we start to think about how we start blending those lines and we use systems and branches that were originally put in place to have a checks and balances system because this is a democratic republic at the end of the day, right? When you think about we're changing how powers and, you know, but like I said, usurping powers into one. Now we're looking at a dictatorship, right? Mm -hmm. And that should really scare people. Like I hear um, so much about, for instance, sir, you talked about land. There are some agricultural pieces in there in that Project 2025 that I don't think anyone's really, really talking about because farmers, they really don't make a whole lot of profit. And you want to take it away from farmers and put it in the hands of corporations. Yeah. And that should concern us. We already see the deregulation of federal agencies and taking the power away from them. When Congress put <coughs> those agencies in place, because of the fact that we felt like something needed to be regulated for the better good of the American people. So I think um, for me, when I think of the laws um, that we need to be considering, we need to be considering um, the separation of the Fed and the state, right? Like we need to be considering, considering back to like our basic civics class, the um, imbalance of power that people are seeking right now and really supporting. And I think that is one of the things when I'm talking to my generation is getting them to understand how that is going to have a trickle down effect. Um, at the local level, you might not feel it as much as you would at the federal level, but think about your taxes. I know, Lord knows when I first started my first real job and I saw those taxes, I'm like, good God almighty. And to see the things that they're wanting me to pay more because I mean, our tax code is not friendly to single people without children and unmarried, right? That's right. Like they're just not. <laughs> so um, when you start to really think about like how when we change the powers in which we are shifting things from the Congress to the executive into the judiciary to weaponize the highest court of the land should really scare people, yeah. right? To the point where you're feeling it um, as an individual. Like think about the young lady who died uh, right. just this past week because she yeah. couldn't have a standard DNC, That's right? right? Like we, we are gonna lose lives and that is how you're going to feel it on the local level. So I just, want people to really think about this, that it's way bigger than us. Um, there are just fundamental rights when this country was founded, although it was with the idea of Anglo-Saxon white males, Christian males. Um, the idea was for those founders that it was a living, breathing document. And we're seeing people just create things out of thin air um, to embolden certain powers or branches of government that really should 
concern us all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm glad you brought up uh, Project 2025. Uh, who in here ever heard of Project 2025? Okay, okay, that's good. I want our panelists to kind of share with us, you know, for those who've heard about Project 2025 or have not heard, what do you think is important for voters to know? And each of you can just go at it. Yeah, I think the most important thing about Project 2025, and I myself as a civil rights attorney, are so concerned about the defunding and destruction of the Department of Education, mm -hmm. where we won't have a Department mm -hmm. of Education on the federal level and it will revert back to the states. But then the second most important thing in this 922 page document is the repurposing of the department, I mean of these, uh, the, the, the Justice Department and changing the Office of Civil Rights into the deportation branch. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to weaponize it to go after uh, our brothers and sisters that uh, may be here on DACA status or may be here uh, in an undocumented status or may be here legally and they just don't like them. So I think that what we need to understand about Project 2025, regardless of whether or not the person who had the writers put it together is now denying he had the writers put it together, <laughs> but the things that are going to happen, and, and like my sister said, my sister in the law said, whenever you have lawyers coming before you saying we are at a constitutional crisis, we are at a moment where the systems are breaking down in real time, yes. you need to be worried. Yeah. You know, I would love to just be in court right now, yeah. you know, yeah. practicing law, you know, <laughs> making some money. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, Charles Hamilton Houston said that a lawyer is either one of two things. He's either, or he or she are either a social engineer or they're a parasite. I'm not trying to be a parasite. No. Yeah. So I'm going to socially engineer you to understand <laughs> the things we should have learned in civics class. Yeah. Yeah. Like she said, there are three co-equal branches, the legislative branch, executive branch, and the judicial branch. Well, Project 2025 empowers the executive branch to be over all of the departments. Yeah. It creates a quasi-monarchy mm -hmm. for a conservative president. That should let you know in a nonpartisan way that we are at an existential threat we haven't seen since the American Revolution. Remember, the whole purpose of the American Revolution was to push back on a monarch. Yeah. Right. So for these people that are running around the country saying they are patriots in 1776, but they're fighting to get a monarch, right. you can tell that we are in an alternate reality of history. So, if you don't read Project 2025 at all, listen to the lawyers and let's give, let us give you the Cliff Notes version. No Department of Education, no Justice Department, no Office of Civil Rights. And for those that are of the wisdom generation that I mentioned earlier, that means no federal troops in the South when there was desegregation happening. That means no Justice Department able to sue a state when they violate your fundamental rights. Wow. That means no civil rights movement. Yeah. It's Bull Connor and uh, the governor of Alabama, I forget his name at this point. Um, George Wallace. George, George Wallace, Wallace running wild. I think we have a few George Wallaces right now. <laughs> Kay Ivey in Alabama. Yeah. Brian in Georgia, that crazy dude down there in Florida named Ron, these people Texas. will be in complete control. The guy in Texas, complete control, because there's no Justice Department. Thank yeah. you. Listen, I, I touch and agree, as we say in church. Um, you all may not have had the opportunity to look at this 922 page. I call it a manifesto. Now, I will also tell you that uh, the Heritage Foundation, as we mentioned earlier, has been around mm -hmm. since the early 70s. Um, the first time they put this document together was for Ronald Reagan in 1981. Right. It was a 3,000 page document then. And they really only focused on four things back in 1981, right? Small government, fiscal conservative, patriotism, and family. That, right? 3,000 pages. Now, fast forward. Right, because there's always going to be a backlash. There, let me say that for the pews in the back. There's always going to be a backlash, right? We, I mean, we saw a backlash during Reconstruction era, right? Y'all remember that? Because Thomas Woodrow Wilson is the first president 105 years ago 
talked about making America great again. He's the first. The second president to talk about making America great was Richard Nixon. Okay. The third president to talk about making America great was Ronald Reagan. And then their fourth is uh, Nacho Cheese. So, so this has been around. This has been around, y'all. This has been around. And we continue. Um, our, our brothers and sisters, white and black, old and young, those who think progressively, those who understand how democracy should work, right? And so this is not just a black thing. This is those who said, let's form the NAACP because we don't want to see black folks getting hung and lynched and murdered and raped and robbed, mm -hmm. right? And so there were some white abolitionists and there were some blacks that got, got together and said, we want to form the NAACP, mm -hmm. right? There were some both formed it Urban League, That's right? right? Yeah. And so, so this is, they not, they're not just coming after black people with Project 2025. They're coming after 18 to 20 million, million immigrants. Mm -hmm. The first rendition that Kevin Roberts, y'all may not know who Kevin Roberts is. He is the one that authored the new version of Project 2025, and he did not refer to folks as citizens. He referred to folks as subjects. Wow. Subjects. Mm -hmm. Kevin Roberts, mm -hmm. president of the Heritage Foundation, the one supposedly that stepped down because the heat was getting too much after Taraji P. Henson said, y'all better wake up to this Project 2025, and the Google search went crazy mm -hmm. for two weeks because we were all started Googling, what is this Project 2025 thing? Right, right. Mm -hmm. Right? And so what scares me as a father and a retired naval officer, a father, four daughters, three sons, love my wife to death, right? What scares me when they say, well, we want to go back. Well, they don't tell you how far back they want to go. Yeah. So let me give you all an example. When they removed Roe v. Wade, as, as my sister said, right? Arizona went back to 1864. We have laws on the books, right? You know this. There are laws on the books that are older than anybody that's living. And they will use those laws on the books to justify what they would do today, right? Gerald Griggs and them, they had a fight against a law that was 150 years old. Yeah. It was 150 years old, Wandelin. Yeah. Because they used a law that was 150 years old to justify killing Ahmaud Arbery. Okay, yes. so if you want to look at Project 2025 a little deeper and closer, they're going to give police officers sovereign immunity. Mm. So if you think it's bad now, when they only got a 2% conviction rate, that means the other 98% police officers go free. Right. They only convict 2%. Sovereign immunity to a police officer, that means you don't have to worry about no criminal or civil, that they can kill you. Sandra Bland. Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. George Floyd, that would be on steroids on what we witnessed in Springfield, Illinois, which is the reason why they created the NAACP. Mm -hmm. The other thing that scares me as a retired naval officer, when they start talking about going back, what's really unnerving for me is that they want to go after the reconstructive amendments, the 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and don't forget about the 19th Amendment. Yeah. They want to go that far back because they said the only three roles that a woman should have is to be a grandmother, a wife, and a mother. They do not want you to vote. Mm. So they want to go after the 19th Amendment. And you're already seeing twinklings of that already. And the reason why they're going after women who vote, because you all vote more. Yeah, God has a sense of humor. There are more women in the world than there are men. Talk about and, more, and more women vote Talk at a more it. frequent basis than men. We vote but just not at the frequency that women do. And last but not least, when you think about this mass deportation, who are they gonna deport? And where are they gonna deport you to? Trump said two days ago, 18 to 20, 18 to 20 million. And he's not just talking about immigrants. That means if, he, if you are white, black, orange, green, if they don't like you, yeah. you're out of here. And they don't care where they send you. And we're seeing Sweden doing that right now. 
right now. Sweden? Yes. <laughs> so don't get it twisted, y'all. This has been around for a while, and they've been doing beta tests all the time. Mm. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Nicole Hines, what, what, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's like, well, <laughs> well you know, um, I think, you know, like I said, the speaker who came before, you know, the Heritage Foundation is not a yeah. new organization. Their plans are not new. Um, it is a conservative uh, group, you know, conservative Republican group um, that's put that out. I think um, for anyone who's looking at this or anybody who's like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, the fear or whatever, it, to me, it should be mobilizing you to vote locally, to vote down ballot. Because if you understand the three branches of government, right, the president can only sign off. They don't create these laws and they don't create these rules. So if for whatever reason you're like, hey, you know, this is a scary moment or I don't like this, I don't like what I've just read, I don't want this to happen, Guess what? It's your congressional seats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's your senators and your. So when we look at, especially in the state of Georgia, we have 13 congressional uh, seats on the ballot this year. That's right. You know, those lines got redrawn. Some people got a little bit more bluish than they probably wanted to in their lives, but they got redrawn. Mm -hmm. We're 14. Don't take one away. Oh, sorry, 14. <laughs> sorry about that. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> sorry about that. 14, but still. You know, we talked about misinformation, disinformation. Yes, I don't want to make sure. Yeah, 14. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah, 14. Um, but <laughs> a little fact check there, right? But still, you know, they these are our congressional seats in federal government, right? 14 seats that we have up there. You know, if anything that's out there, regardless if it's Project 2025, Project 2029, Project, 30, you know, 2033, because every time there's a presidential election, they do put out these policies. One of the things I always talked about, and I know, you know, I know uh, Gerald and Derek has heard me say this before, I said, you know, I date myself with this. 30 plus years ago, there was a whole stir up about dumbing down America. We started doing education to pass tests. Mm. Critical thinking went out the window. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thirty years ago, I actually had this conversation with a friend because she was saying that she, you know she had an employee that was forty some years old, can't critically think. You know, it's like having young people. I said, no, think back. If they're forty, that means they were ten when standardized testing started happening. Mm -hmm. That means all through their pre-adolescence and adult life, all they were learning was how to pass a test. Mm -hmm. There was no longer scrap paper. There was no more write out your answer. You know, if read you a book, book yeah. talk about <laughs> read it. a book. Yeah. If you do a did, book report, right? If you did five yeah. comments or you hit five of these topics, I'll give you some thoughts to it. Those things have you know no longer happen. It's not Gen Z. It is anybody who's actually younger than Gen X, right? Wow. So if you think about, it, we have multiple generations that have grown up to do standardized testing and not critically think. So we have to look at more when we look at projects like Project 25 or any of those uh, conservative talking points. It's how do we get back to critical thinking, right? How do we allow people to understand the pros and cons of what's written? And how, if you are for it, then you're for it. But still, even if you're for it, you still got to vote for people who are going to pass it. Yeah. If you're against it, how do you, you know, make sure that it doesn't enact? Because you have to vote people who are against it. Part of that is knowing to vote for people who sympathize and empathize with all of your needs. That's right. Not just one little highlight of your life. You have to look at the candidates and say, who sympathizes and empathizes mostly with all of my needs? Mm -hmm. And that's telling you, like, you know, and that's when you look at those, those theories or my wish list, right? And, you know, maybe it is, you know, as you said, God intervention that, you know, maybe it became public and was on a new, you know, they might have done it on purpose. Who knows? You know, all conspiracy theories could be out there about this. But it should be a wake-up call for us to know yes. and to teach us civics because civics is out the door. I know yeah. I, took, I took a whole year of government, you know, it's like in high school. I was like, you had to take a whole year of government before you graduated. So civics is out the door. They don't understand how a bill is actually passed. So as we are looking at our presidential candidates and saying, oh my gosh, this is going to happen, this is what's going to happen, the people who are underneath are doing what they're doing. All of our state legislators are on the ballot this year. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I talk about, and I know this is not on Project 2025, but one of the things I talk about is Medicaid expansion in the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. It's federally funded, but the state controls the funds. Yeah. Yeah. But yet people in the state will complain that their hospitals are closed, they got to go to another state to deal with mental health, but you're not voting for your state legislators. Mm 